Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Ankush Gaikwar from MQ Medical Team. And I welcome you all to this new again series of no thrombosis workshop in acute ischemic stroke. Acute ischemic stroke is a topic which never gets old and each case is a unique and interesting case. So this platform gives an opportunity to learn and interact from our eminent speakers about new cases in their clinical practice and also gain knowledge from our course directors and moderators about the management of acute ischemic stroke. So with this small in info, I welcome all the faculty members in this workshop, uh, our speakers and all our participants and audience in this workshop. I'm uh, pleased to introduce our course director uh, for today's workshop, Dr. Subhash Kolsa. So he's a senior, senior consultant and stroke specialist as Kim's uh, Foundation and Research Sikandrabad, has been a faculty for more than uh, three decades uh, in Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences and former professor and head at Department of Neurology and Dean at NIMS. So has over 120 publications, has been a principal and co-investigator of many studies and past president of AP Neuroscientist Association, past president of Indian Stroke Association and past president of Indian Academy of Neurology. I welcome you Dr. Subhash also. Uh, our moderators for today are Dr. Uh, Minakshi Sundram sir, uh, sir is a senior consultant neurologist at Apollo Hospitals, Madurai, has over two decades of experience in neurology and has presented various uh, papers and presentations at prestigious national as well as international forums, has received best uh, research paper award at 10th annual conference of Indian Academy of Neurology, Lucknow, principal investigator for many international studies like that in epilepsy, stroke and uh, PD, editor of South Asian uh, edition of the book Practical Neurology and also contributed to many books on neurology. Uh, welcome, sir. Uh, our next moderator is Dr. Anirudh Kulkarni. Sir is a consultant interventional neurologist at Apollo Hospital, Jayanagar, Bangalore. Sir is a member of uh, American Academy of Neurology, Indian Academy of Neurology, and member of Indian Stroke Association. So, stroke expertise of Dr. Kulkarni uh, is in implementation of stroke protocol diagnostic uh, procedures, mechanical thrombectomy, uh, stenting, Doppler studies, and also um, uh, specialized in maintenance stroke unit, sir, as multiple publications and poster presentations to his credit. Uh, I welcome Dr. Kilkarni to this forum. I'm pleased to introduce our two speakers for today, uh, Dr. Brijal Chaudhary. Uh, Dr. Chaudhary is a consultant neurologist at Apex Hospital, Jaipur. Uh, so has six publications in various journals. Uh, skills include stroke management, headache and epilepsy treatment, movement disorders treatment, uh, dementia, disease management, electrophysiology. I welcome Dr. Chaudhary to this forum. And we look forward for your exciting case. Uh, our next speaker for today is Dr. Pramod uh, Donde. So he's a consultant neurologist at Nanded and director of Tonde Hospital and Shivansh uh, Neuro Rehabilitation Center at Nanded. Sir has been expertise in managing ICU over a decade, neuro ICU since a decade, has uh, publications to his credit. And uh, very interesting fact about sir and his hobby is sir has been working as an environmentalist since last six years. So I welcome Dr. Pramod to his forum and look forward for your case. So with this, Brief introduction, I hand over to Dr. Subhash Kolsar for uh, welcome remarks. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, sir. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, MQR, for giving us this opportunity of holding yet another session of uh, no thrombosis. And as you know, every uh, month we discuss important, very unique cases and uh, learn from the individual experiences of the presenters. So I welcome all the participants. I actually send them will probably join in for the first time and both of the presenters. Over to the moderators. Namaste, sir. Very excited to learn from you and from the speakers, sir. Just waiting, sir. Thank you, sir.
Hello. So, with your permission, can we go ahead with the uh, first presentation? Sir, other moderator, if he has something to say. Dr. Andrew. Uh, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure to actually work with Paul, sir, and Mina Kishnaram, sir. I've had a lot of work here. Uh, I hope to learn a lot from you also, sir. We can continue with the lectures. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I thank you. Thank the faculty for a kind introduction and being the session. I request our uh, first speaker, Dr. Brijal Chaudhary, if uh, so, can present his first case and uh, also share the screen. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes. So you're audible. Please go ahead. The screen is also visible. Today we will discuss a case report or case presentation of a stroke patient. A 56-year-old young lady presented with complaint of known case of hypertension, presented with sudden onset weakness, right side body with slurring of speech. Patient brought in emergency after two hours of on stroke onset. Physical examination was done in emergency and all written investigations sent. MRI brain suggestive of infarct in left visual ganglia. In vitals, patients BP was 160 by 90, and RVS was 110. NIHSS score at presentation was six, in which facial palsy score for facial palsy one, motor arm right side two, and motor arm left side, oh, sorry, motor, uh, motor arm right side two, Motor leg right side two and for dysarthria two. Total score was six at presentation. And this is MRI of that patient, which is showing left side visual ganglia and far. Patient thrombolyzed with tenectase according to weight. And after thrombolysis, NCCT was done and MRI angiography also was done to rule out large vessel occlusion and that and those uh, both was normal and patient discharged after five days with NIHS score was four. In NIHS score, improvement was uh, patient's facial palsy and dysarthria completely recovered at discharge score was four. Thank you. So I think this patient made a good recovery. Yes, sir. So Milakshi, you have any comments? Yes, sir. Sir, very happy to be seeing one of the uh, most straightforward cases after a very, very long time, sir. <laughs> so happy to see that. And the, the etiology of stroke, was it considered? Was there any cardioembolism or anything? Because it's sitting right in the basal ganglionic region. What was the workup done for the etiology of the stroke? What was it? Sir, we we have done 2D echo and, and bilateral carotid doppler also, sir. And angiography both head and neck vessels, but we did not find anything, sir. Most likely, sir, cardiomyelin, because patient only, sir, hypertensive, no history of other comorbidities like diabetes or other. And ECG was also normal, sir. No, but then in that case, it becomes your patient becomes an embolic stroke of unknown significance or uncertain source. So you will have to do his uh, trans-esophageal echocardiography. You may have to do two, two weeks of Holter, at least two weeks of loop recording uh, because it's mandatory. Once we don't find an etiology, then it's important for us to do these. Okay, thank you. But, but is he hypertensive and diabetic? Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Patient was hypertensive. I think this is one of the very straightforward cases that. And they would be, if there are no etiologies, we also do routinely a CD angiogram rather than MR angiogram. So if you do not have an etiology, that's sitting there. Is that correct practice, sir? Uh, for CT angio, if there is no etiology, you would prefer CT angio to MR angio? We'll prefer CT angiogram over MRI. That's what we have been practicing. If, if we don't course, straightforward source, we don't do it subsequently. If etiology is not there, as in this case, if T is also negative, we do a CT angiogram. Ask them to trace even the arch of the iota. Ask them to do completely for us to give a picture. Okay. What we have been doing since. That makes sense to look at the arch of your side. Yeah. The other thing would be, sir, could we actually do a DSA to actually see whether there's any sorts of embolus or many times what happens is that some of these smaller uh, either carotid webs or uh, smaller clots can be missed on either both CT angio and uh, MR angio is definitely less sensitive. So if, I mean, that would be after the cardiac evaluation, if cardiac evaluation uh, does not show a significant either we don't get an atrial fibrillation or if there are no sometimes there are some papers that have also said that occasional VPCs also can precipitate. So if nothing is there, then probably a diagnostic angio would be ideal to look at some other you know occult source that is there in the heart or somewhere or in the vessels along the way. See, it depends upon the to what extent we want to chase the um, source. Yes, and yes. it has to be associated with the local infrastructure and the interest of the doctor. Uh, if you look at the uh, these days, the recent papers, they are even advocating cardiac MRI. Yes. And they yes. are saying they are saying cardiac MRI is better than echo. And echo cannot pick up what cardiac MRI. But in all, not only that, if you see the ESS workup. They are asking to do PET scan on. And uh, you just look into it. They are asking to do PET yes. scan because they are saying that malignancy is an important cause of uh, unknown source. But, you know, what I'm saying is that uh, in a, at, at a practical level, at a practical level, you know, in our day-to-day -day practice, I think uh, the least you want to do initially is uh, ET or MRI. You need to have a vascular imaging. And uh, you can do that can be CT angio or MR angio, depending once again on our infrastructure. Then um, carotid Doppler, because you would look at that uh, carotid artery. And if, uh, and at least 24 hours hold. Now, if you don't get anything from that, then as per the literature, you should go at least TEE and uh, two week hold. And, uh, but beyond that, you can go for anything. Then there is no. Thing. Depends upon your own infrastructure and your own interest and the financial. But I think what all of us are telling you is that uh, even though patient is doing well, that there's always a chance of recurrence. And tomorrow yes. he may again land up with. So therefore, you must know, particularly because his vascular imaging, the brain is normal. So I think uh, there is uh, not. Uh, do do you have any questions to ask? Uh, or do you have any comments? Sir, no. uh, yeah. Sir, uh, these regarding these loop recorders, are there any modified loop recorders available uh, which can be gone at, uh, which can be done and uh, that can carry for two weeks? These ILRs, they, I think they put into the skin, no? And uh, They put in the skin, yeah. But nowadays there are some different loop recorders available which can uh, be superficially, that can be carried. Are, are, are these like that? The one, which, the one which we are uh, doing is uh, that is put under skin all only. But yeah. I think uh, I, I also heard recently that yeah, yeah, watch yeah. and something like uh, like an Apple watch and all. But but at a practical level again, only these under the skin. Okay. Minakshi may be knowing. Minakshi, do you have any other? Uh, no, sir, what I said, one up to one week, the charges are okay. So it comes around ten or twelve thousand. If they do it before beyond one week, the charges go very high. And the two weeks will be roughly around 25,000, sir. I have actually I have quoted that NEJM paper which talked about Apple Watch being, you know, as useful as any other method. There was NEJM paper. So I tell the choice to them, sir. 
that one week I usually I do. I'm going only for one week, and so maybe it's time for us to quit and shift to two weeks. Or some recommendation comes as only even thirty days also nowadays. I'm told. So I don't know what is uh, the But, correct uh, indication. No, yeah, you are right. There is no recommendation. There is no. Rec they, they, they are saying they are saying you can do it up to three months, but it is not compulsory to do it. Then again, it depends on the enthusiasm. Some people say they have to do six months. But one thing is sure. That the yield of these loop recorders is not very high. It's not very high. Even at the end of three years, if you do continuous loop recording for three years, you will probably pick. Uh, you know, if you take hundred patients out of those hundred, you will probably pick twenty. Eighty, you will still not pick. They will still the thing will remain. And in fact, we are also uh, doing loop recording. Our our uh, Uh, you know, yield is not very high. I mean, it's not seventy percent. It's not eighty percent. It's less than thirty percent. But just that we we have the satisfaction that at least we we don't want to miss that thirty. We in fact we have not found even we do only two weeks, and I think out of thirty uh, or so in the last only one or two have come forth. So and as the time goes on, the, it becomes less. But at the same time, at present everybody is recommending, so we have to do it. I think two weeks seems reasonable because as the time goes on, then the chances of picking up becomes less. Sir, so how how much cost it for for you? How much did it charge? It is ten thousand, ten thousand for two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, but they give concession also. Once you give them cases, then they give concession. And in a given case, they do free also. But you can't. I mean, they will do free if you refer them ten patients. Then they will do one. In our place, one week they charge ten thousand. So maybe it's time for us to ask for a better rates than this. Yes. Yes. those uh, data from that embrace trial they also talked about almost one month if i remember is it correct sir embrace yeah, data that's true. still a from embrace data yeah yeah so uh so then should we move to the second case unless unless anybody wants to make any right share my screen Yes, sir. Is my screen visible? Yes. Uh, at the outset, I thank uh, uh, Kaul sir and uh, Dr. Kulkarni sir. and uh, dr minakshi sundaram to be here to listen and to learn from you and uh, this is one of the case i just think that this is very interesting case for me because uh, we have thrombolyzed almost more than 300 or 400 patients in our setup in last 8 to 9 years and there are last case which i have presented was of uh, central retinal artery occlusion in the same forum and which has made a re remarkable recovery with tenect plays now this case is very unique uh, from my point of view might you might have seen this these kind of cases also but uh, let us learn from you from regarding this case i called it as a life reborn in this case uh he is a 45 year old male with history of diabetes mellitus well controlled since 4 years presented uh, on 13th of jan 2023 with uh, at 6:45 pm with gait ataxia and dysarthria with onset since 3 hours and uh, he already came with mri brain angio because they he was referred from outside so that he got it done and he came to us his bp was 140 by 90 pulse rate 88 per minute peripheral pulsations were normal he has very severe headache so headache was very severe means you can say visual analog scale of 10 for this headache and with vomitings with pain at the nape of neck bilaterally and uh, he uh, he was just not bearing the pain and uh, he was continuously telling while starting on at the onset of thrombolysis he was having severe headache and all these things were going on uh, this was a nhs score we call it this posterior circulation nhs score of 10 i will just brief it up about it later and uh, he came with the mri brain with angio done he was having bilateral cerebellar infarcts as shown with left more than right involvement it was uh, sca territory as well as the spica territory involvement was seen on the mri brain and it was corresponding diffusion restriction is same in this case and uh, on the mr angio right vertebral artery looks thrombosed here because it the flow was not there at the beginning of the vertebral artery as it at gets uh, uh, near the basilar artery and it is showing some flow 
but at the onset of uh, entry into this uh, int uh, intracranial part it is looking like a thrombosed or probably dissected because he was having very severe headache uh, after informed consent thrombolysis started uh, with actylize with 50 mg dose 5 mg bolus and according to his weight it was appropriate dose and 45 mg uh, in this 250 ml ns was started at 7.35, after just after half dose, means after around 7.30 p.m., at 7 p.m. it has been started. And after at 7.30 p.m., half after half dose, patient started decortic posturing with GCS dropped to 3. It was suddenly so bad because uh, we didn't th thought that he was going to go down so severely. And uh, with le left people got dilated, we got frightened because we thought that it must be a blade or something else because uh, or either a progressive stroke has been happening. So to rule out bleed, we have stopped the thrombolysis and immediately CT brain done. Within 15 minutes, we could do the CT. And this was the CT and it was showing probably spot sign was positive here and basilar artery was thrombosed here. It was the top of basilar probably uh, that is getting involved. And uh, we thought that we have, we have lost the patient probably because it was not recanalizing. So spot sign was suggestive of progressive thrombosis in the basilar artery. At 7.45 p.m. after the th CT, we started restarted the thrombolysis. With the remaining dose completed, GCS remained same. Even low molecular weight heparin was also given. We, we were desperate in uh, saving the patient. And with the dose with the atrovastatin of 80 mg was given at the same time. Thought we lost the patient as pupil remained dilated after thrombolysis. At around the at around 8:50 p.m., probably uh, 45 minutes after the thrombolysis, he was started moving upper limbs with pupil started reacting. 9:30 p.m., patient regained consciousness. And 10:30 p.m. apart from ataxia, patient fully normalized. This was the magic happened so that we we were initially counseling the relatives that he's going to get he's not going to get better. Probably artery got thrombosed and there was progressive stroke. So in any case, you can't reach any place where it can the DSA and all this can be done and mechanical thrombosis can be done because it is not available at at our setup at, or in our city also. So we were just telling them that the prognosis is not going to get better. But this has been magic had happened in this patient. Next day, MRI brain with angio seems to show recanalized vertebral with infarcts in both cerebellar semi-hispias and patchy occipital infarcts. So this was the recanalized vertebral artery which has been as initially it was thrombosed and now it has been shown very good flow and basilar artery looks okay now. And these are the patchy infarcts. The size of infarcts has a little bit increased and it was involving some uh, involvement in the brain this uh, uh, along the occipital cortex also. This is the SCA territory as well as the PICA territory was involved in this. So on further workup, his carotid Doppler and 2D were unremarkable. Repeal profile was showing mild TG elevation. Now the questions in this case is uh, what does the severe headache and neck pain suggest whether it's a sign of dissection with progressive stroke. And in this case, have we done the justice with giving LT plays or should I have given tenecti plays in such cases? Or is it an ESUS with red thrombus? And comments, comments about the post NIHSS. I, I, I will just show the slides later on. Can you have some comments about this case? Any 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 comments about Sir Kaul Sir, Anirudh Kulkarni Sir, Sundar Meenakshi Sundaram Sir? Yeah, Meenakshi, you can give. Sir, my first diagnosis in this case was only dissection, sir. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly, patients with posterior circulation stroke do tend to progress. I don't think we need to, you know, uh, restrict our criteria for treating these patients. As late as four days ago, we had a patient who had some symptoms at 7, 8, 7 a.m. in the morning, consulted us on the next day at 12 afternoon for the same giddiness and unsteadiness. The patient was seen and we got an MRI done. It showed process of patient stroke. We admitted him. In front of us, he developed ptosis within two hours. His sensorium dropped, developed ophthalmoplegia by around four hours. We did mechanical thrombectomy at 19 hours. And today the patient is getting discharged only four days later. So in case of post-circulation stroke, the point we learn is that it can definitely show a progressive course, which was the case in your case also. You are giving thrombolysis. Still, the patient showed progression. It is also possible in postural circulation stroke. Unlike the anterior circulation stroke, they can have a real big as late as you know, in 2007, I remember in stroke, there was a paper about doing endovascular procedure, not with the, the high pay procedures we have, those endovascular procedures of 2007 being done in a patient with postural circulation stroke mm -hmm. at seven days. 
This was a paper in Stroke Journal. So what it tells is that post-circulation stroke do tend to get progressed. And this patient looks very typical of dissection to me. You have to go show me the other images also. I, in my opinion, this is dissection. Is there any other comment I would take straight away? And I also, because of the severe headache and vomiting and this um, vascular occlusion, which got resolved, uh, and with the superadded thrombus, which got resolved, I think dissection is... I, I even I do tend to agree that it is dissection, but I have a small uh, doubt whether actually if we can see in the first imaging, we see that the vertical is occluded and then we thrombolize and uh, then we have the thrombus going up. So could it be also possible that the thrombolysis precipitated the thrombus, you know, breaking down and part of it migrating upwards? That is one thing because, I mean, yeah, the ideal thing to do in this case, yes, is definitely do a thrombolysis indicated, I totally agree. But unless, if it is a dissection, then probably more than thrombolysis, would it not be better if the patient directly went on to a low molecular weight heparin uh, to prevent any further progression of the dissection or, you know, progression or prevent further formation of new thrombi, that is one thing. Second thing, yes, in patients where the thrombus has migrated, uh, yeah, probably I, I also have had a similar patient where, you know, patient had a basal top, but where it's very well preserved, NHS, post NHS is hardly one. So we did do a mechanical, but next day morning he worsened. But uh, immediately, within a few minutes of worsening, I did the mechanical thrombectomy, but unfortunately he ended up with permanent deficits, a significant deficit. So that is something in probably in this case, the patient was pretty lucky that he got away without much deficits. Uh, in spite of him showing uh, infarcts, even top of SLR, there is a thalamic infarct also on the MRI. So in this case, my question to sir would be whether actually these kind of cases uh, where the basilar is fully open and you have patchy infarcts and you're sure that is probably a vertebral source and likely given the history that it is a dissection, should we actually do thrombolysis or should we directly go on to... Uh, low molecular heparin or even conventional heparin? Uh, no, uh, I mean, I see the logic of your uh, comment, but uh, as per the guidelines, yes. uh, as per the guidelines for all strokes, irrespective of the etiology, intravenous thrombolysis has to be given. I think the only exception is the stroke because of uh, infective endocarditis. That is the only absolute contraindication. But short of infective endocarditis emboli, uh, whether it is dissection or whether it is atherosclerosis, we have to give that IV thrombolysis. Because after all, dissection also, uh, there is a superadded thrombus on top of that. Uh, that has to be dissolved. Uh, obviously, if it's an aortic dissection, then it's a complete uh, uh, contraindication. But uh, in the initial part of the uh, literature uh, development for IV thrombolysis, this used to be a question whether we should thrombolyze these patients or not. But eventually, there was a consensus that we should also should be. So, uh, but after thrombolysis, obviously, we have to give them heparin or even double NG. The devastation happened so rapidly in this case. Actually, the GCS was gone up to three. So we are really worried what has happened to him. And definitely, the thrombus has progressed or embolism has happened to the top of basilar. And then it has we canalized. I'll show the next slides. Sir, sir, hold on, hold on, hold on. Sir, hold on. sir I'll ask this doubt also again here. Just my doubt, which is... See, the point is, even in dissection, as Sir said, there is an indication to give IV thrombolysis. When it comes to dissection and the thrombectomy, yeah. so far, hardcore data is available for thrombectomy for anterior circulation in dissection. Is there dogmatic evidence for mechanical thrombectomy in post circulation dissection? I do not know. Severe no, no, no. All these, all the research, uh, research I mean, big studies, they have, their criteria has been only MCA. They have not uh, done PCA. PCA is only case reports and case series. But big studies have been done. We are the PCA is just an extrapolation that because it is helping in the anterior, therefore it would help. But the data is all based based on anterior circulation. You are completely correct. And the second thing I want to clarify this doubt, sir. Here is a patient who is likely to progress. Even if we give IV thrombolysis, when can we give heparin, sir? Because guidelines say 24 hours don't give any antipatent anticoagulation. So what do we do really in this patient, sir? After See, thrombolysis, what I'll do we tell do? you. I'll tell you. I think when you 
when we raise these questions, we are basically concerned with the with our safety also, <laughs> whether we will be tomorrow caught if some problem occurs. Now, in guidelines of 2021, 2021 guidelines are, it's a 52-page document, and uh, it is wonderful. I mean, you need one full day to read it, but it answers all questions. So it very clearly says that in situations where it, it doesn't talk about heparin, but it talks about antiplatelets. And it says in situations where antiplatelets are indicated, you can give it as early as eight hours. It's clearly written there. So in this, this patient, I would start antiplatelets at eight hours. I'll give only one antiplatelet after eight hours. And then after 24 hours, I will go to heparin. Because antiplatelet, if you take dissection in dissection, antiplatelets also will work. But heparin would be uh, uh, probably one shot we can give. One shot is allowed even before that. So, so, so you know, we have, to, we have to come around it. There is no clear-cut answer to any guideline. But we are, are very concerned with the progression uh, of the, the thrombus. So therefore, I would uh, probably give him a tablet of aspirin and one shot of LMWS. That we have given, sir. Six hours we have started. And uh, your choice of altiplase versus tenecteplase. So, would like to know why you chose the altiplase versus tenecteplase in this case. What was the reason for choosing altiplase, sir? Actually, we also like altiplase here. Tell me. Uh, this, patient, this patient came actually at around three hours, and uh, uh, we thought that we are not sure about uh, what kind of uh, patient was very comfortable. He was having just gait attacks and everything. So uh, we 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 didn't we didn't make any choice from that point of view. We thought that it is better to give alteplase as a robust data. What we thought in tenecteplase, there is no no any certain thing which uh, which has been why it hasn't been given. It's like that. So one one thing which I will again clarify is what I will do in a patient where I feel that there may be some progression, like posterior circulation. Mm -hmm. So, where we can give some infusion, like you give in altiplase, maybe it has some advantage, maybe theoretically, I do not know, because you run something for a longer time. Is that correct? Is that why you chose altiplase in this patient? Yes, 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 sir. From that point of view, you can say like that. Yeah. What do you say, sir? Call, sir, about this? <laughs> no, I mean, that... That is a that is our that is what we feel, but I don't think it's mentioned anywhere that we have to choose um, infusion, long infusion for dissection. But it said that tenecteplase has a long half life as compared to the alteplase, though it has been given. Yeah, that nullifies this benefit. Absolutely correct, because it stays there for a long system. What you are doing by infusion, the drug does by itself. That is the argument there. I do not know. Just it is in your mind, you know, instead of something happening inside, you feel that you are doing something. Yeah. It gives some psychic edge at that point of time. That's why I asked. I was curious only because of this. Probably I thought you chose altiplase because there was dissection in your mind and you felt that some progression could happen. And we always have some control of some MRA, something happening. Because as Sir was saying, whether the uh, case is indicated for IV thrombus, one of the theoretical points is that there may be an intramural hematoma which can progress. That is one of the theoretical arguments stroke specialists tell us why they should go for mechanical thrombectomy directly for this case. Probably I thought that was the reason why he chose that case. It was just in my no, mind. I think, I think I think his logic was that he was nearing three hours. And, uh, right. Yeah. Three next, hours was the basic logic. That's why we are thought better to give altiplase rather than tenecteplase. Now approval is there for 4.5 hours. Tenecteplase approved. Can freely use. Yeah, yeah. DCJ is approved. Yeah, but in the uh, international trials, it is still three hours, no, sir. Are we justified in giving up to 4.5 hours now? I think we can give, right? We don't have to oh, yes. about interest. No, no. Inter internationally, the, uh, most of the trials, now the recent trials, like extent, uh, intra arterial and all, they have taken 4.5 hours. Oh, they have sure. completely replicated the GPO. Completely replicated. It was only Indian trial which had taken only three hours. That was our problem. And uh, But internationally, 4.5, I think there is no problem at all. We can just mention it. I, I think that is no longer an issue. But still, those of us who want to be extremely cautious and all that thing, they give three hours. But I think if we document and inform the patient, then five hours is okay. 
Now the DCJ has given approval also. I don't know whether sir, that approval has come sir. on paper, but we know that it has given there. Sir, and even sir. before DCJ gave approval, I think everyone, we were all doing, even at 4.5 hours, we were giving only time to place, sir. Most of us. Even before approval, I think that's what, what people were doing, which includes sir. us. That's true. Should I go to the next slide? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. So it was, I think it was probably what my feeling was that it is a right ICB a thrombus throwing shower of emboli because initial slide was showing. It was, if we go back, the first slide was showing. Uh, it was a SCA involvement, superior cerebellar artery involvement on the left side more. And uh, it is P pica territory involvement on both sides. So it was the, probably ICV thrombosis from my point of view. It might be dissection also. And uh, right ICV thrombosis throwing shower of emboli going up to the top of basilar leading to acute deterioration followed by the recanalization that has happened in this case. And this was the diagram from uh, Louis Kaplan's book which has been mentioned as the proximal, middle and distal parts of the uh, involvement of uh, posterior circulation stroke. They have mentioned as proximal, middle and distal. And uh, these are the various ICBA presentations, asymptomatic occlusion, TIAs, lateral medullary infarct is one of the most common, followed by rarely by this medial medullary infarct, infarction one of the medulla, including the lateral medial medulla on one side, cerebellar infarction on the, in pica territory, embolization of ICBA thrombus to the distal basilar artery and its branching is branching, causing, uh, causing TIAs or strokes, propagation of ICBA thrombus into the basilar artery, causing a basilar artery syndrome. And uh, this was the registry of uh, symptoms and signs of posterior circulation stroke, ischemia in New England Medical Center, uh, posterior circulation registry from uh, Louis Kaplan Group. And they have, again, I'm telling that they, this is the proximal, middle, and distal. The most pro frequent posterior cir circulation symptoms were dizziness, unilateral limb weakness, dysarthria, headache, and nausea, vomiting. And most frequent signs were unilateral limb weakness, gait ataxia, unilateral limb ataxia, dysarthria, and nystagmus. Clinical features of dysphagia, nausea, or vomiting, dizziness, and hornet syndrome were positively correlated with proximal vascular territory, uh, which in this case, in our case, that has been shown. Unilateral limb weakness and cranial nerve seven deficits were positively correlated with the middle territory, and the limb sensory deficit and visual field loss were positively correlated with the distal territory. This was the one of the registry that has been uh, shown in uh, from Louis Kaplan's group, and. Uh, the choice of agent, TNK or antiplase, is a big question again comes and uh, many of them might be using, depends on the probably preference and uh, all these things are there, still more data, robust data needed. And uh, this was the one of the study from 1994, thrombodynamic therapy in experimental embolic stroke. I couldn't get the whole article. The, but the uh, crux in this case, one of the, uh, the comments has been mentioned is that the ability to recanalization in experimental embolic stroke is related to the amount of red cells in the emboli and inversely related to the volume of emboli and to the fibrin content and density of the clots. And uh, the larger clots in situ thrombosis with atherosclerosis and proximal clots are resistant to thrombolysis, while cardioembolic strokes have fibrin-rich clots which respond better to IVT. So accordingly, we can choose the uh, what kind of medication TNK or multiplase. So this was one of the article from uh, this extent uh, I TNK study group which uh, Sir was mentioning. Tenetiplase versus uh, Altiplase before endovascular therapy in basilar artery occlusion and uh, this was from two, March 2021 study. It was the conclusion was that the reperfusion was happened. These were more 110 patients were included in this study. Reperfusion more than 50% occurred in 26% that is 19, uh, 5 out of 19 patients thrombolyzed with TNK versus 7% that is 6 out of 91 patients thrombolyzed with Altiplase. Despite shorter thrombolysis to arterial puncture time in the TNK treated patients. 48 minutes versus articulate treated patient 110 minutes. So this was the conclusion. So that TNK has a better profile in uh, uh, posterior circulation stroke as the study has been suggested and more and more data data is coming. So probably the right kind of drug would have been tenetiplase in this case uh, rather than antiplase. And uh, regarding this post NHSS, uh, this was the thing which has been mentioned in post NHSS score: gait and trunk limb ataxia. While uh, these nine points, three points were given for ataxia and nine points for uh, five for abnormal cuff and four for dysphagia. So whenever we are having doubt about the NHSS grading, so post NHSS can be useful in the, uh, assess, uh, mentioning, uh, uh, assessing the reperfusion in posterior circulation stroke. And uh, this is the last slide. And uh, this is one of the sentence from uh, George Bernard Shaw that some men see things as they are and say, why? I dream things that never were and say, why not? I think evolution of tenectiplase has been the mark 
that this sentence seems to prove because tenic nucleides are evolved over the period of time for this last three to four years as a better molecule as compared to the antiplase in posterior circulation stroke. And at the end, I thank again your team and uh, sir, and I just now like to know the comments about this case and one when uh, any new learning from me from uh, your point of view, sir. So when you uh, when you uh, were thrombolizing this patient, uh, were you also mentally ready that he might need a mechanical thrombectomy? Might they need preparation for that, or that's not available? Actually, it is not available, sir. Here, so we were just uh, telling them that the prognosis is not going to be good. So let us do whatever the best possible can be done here because patient is. It is not possible to send patients from Nanded to Hyderabad. Now Hyderabad is the closest uh, place to go. Uh, reaching there also, it will take some time. We can, if we can say that 24 hours also, then also we are telling them that do you go and see, just see what can be done. But GCS was almost three and left people got dilated. So I thought okay, whether. So even if we, if we do mechanical thrombectomy with that GCS, it would not have been better prognosis for him. And gradually he started yeah. discovering yeah. Then he thought that it is better to do it now. But and there he, was no there was no dense infarct of the brain stem as such. No, sir, no, no. That's what that's what we were surprised, no. But because he deteriorated within half an hour, so deteriorated fast. I didn't see that kind of recovery in any patients, whatever we have thrombolite till because that. Because usually it is seen that if there's an infarct of the brain stem, dense infarct, then the outcome is not really good. When the interventionist, I think doctor. Anirudh may probably want to comment on it. Interventionist yes. also gives a prognosis on which which part of the basal artery or vertebral artery is affected. I mean, there's a difference in the prognosis between the distal basal and the mid basal and the proximal basal. I think that they, they think that the, probably the distal basal has got the best prognosis. Doctor, yes, I think distal basal usually are more commonly embolic. And uh, they tend to recanalize either with IVT or mechanical. They tend to recanalize easier than... Uh, proximal basilla, which are usually, they have some underlying atherosclerotic lesion with a ruptured plaque or an unstable plaque. So yes, definitely, uh, distal basilla lesions do have a better prognosis, unless, of course, there are dense thalamic infarcts, which will then, you know, something like an artery of Percheron syndrome that would portend a poor prognosis. But in this case, yes, probably even if the GCS is very poor, that probably would have been because the basilar top is occluded and you know thalamus are not receiving the blood that they should. So in those cases, recanalization would probably have a much uh, better outcome. Uh, like in this case, probably, I mean, uh, thanks to his, uh, whatever it was, thanks to the drugs that he received. So yeah, he did have a recanalization. I think that was a good outcome. I think probably, this is... Yes, think this is, is a, yes, please go ahead, sir. This is a this is a perfect example of the case which where the tissues were functional but they were not dead, exactly. but they were completely dysfunctional. Dysfunctional. I mean, it, probably if one or two or three hours would have passed, then you were he would he would have been dead. Yes, but sir. he before the before the uh, I mean they were ischemic but they were not dead. Uh, so before that you got it, and it's the best example of that. Uh, one thing I was very curious to know: you said spot sign. I'm aware of the spot sign in the brain hemorrhage where it means the propensity to expand hematoma. But is this is also called spot sign? In its yes, sir, yes. Thrombosed artery is also called spot sign, probably. Um, yeah, you can say it as a spot sign, probably because you're looking at the basilar end-on. So when you see it in the MCA, it's usually not end-on. It is more lateral view. So you say a hyperdense MCA kind of things. So probably we could put it as a hyperdense basilar in this. Going nice case. Going on this bad, bad GCS, and almost uh, the recovery started almost uh, after one hour of uh, this thrombolysis completion. So that uh, till one hour he was just GCS was around same. So that we were we thought that we had lost the patient and uh, we were very sad and uh, gloomy mm -hmm. on the day. But that recovery made a day like that. Uh, it has been going to be made, make us happy for a very long time. I think one thing that I have noticed with posterior circulation is usually that one, it gives you time like anterior circulation does not. So a lot of people, the resistance of the posterior circulation tissue to ischemia, especially the brainstem is much, much higher. So the time you get with posterior circulation, even though the patients appear to be much more morbid compared to anterior circulation, especially if you look at right-sided MCA occlusions, they appear to be pretty well-preserved. 
So compared to that, basilar occlusions usually come with a very bad uh, morbidity, but then they give you time like anterior circulation does not. So probably, yes, my recommendation, posterior circulation, I think we chase it, we have chased it even up to 48 hours. In some cases, we have got good results. Regarding this case, so as Sir was saying, this mid basilar and the, the proximal basilar, they are more of atherosclerosis. Now, there are certain peculiar things here. For instance, if a patient has got involvement of both vertebral arteries as against only single vertebral artery, the prognosis is better. What you tend to think is that if there is a Single vertebral artery involvement, atherosclerotic, the prognosis will be better. The reverse is true because more the involvement bilaterally, more the chance of developing collaterals. Probably this patient had excellent collaterals. That is why even though the patient went down to the point of decerebration, still the patient didn't have a chance to come out. It tells us that there is actually a good collaterals. Also, the distant basilar, what we are sir was saying was that distant basilar occlusion for by intervention like mechanical thrombectomy or even IV thrombolysis, with the intervention, they have a very good prognosis. If we do not intervene them, they have devastating prognosis because it is usually a large embolus, the clot goes and acutely blocks. It has not given enough time for collaterals to develop. Distal basilar involvement more common with cardioembolism. Embolisms are more common. So they do not really give a chance for the patient to have developed the collaterals. Whereas the proximal basilars, the mid basilars, they are given time enough for collaterals to form. We can also do two more things. You can do it with your own imaging. You can just share the image. One is that in addition to posterior circulation, NIHSS, which you showed, you can also do a posterior circulation aspects. There is an aspect, sir. Can you yes. show that previous image? So we can do the PC aspects also. They give scoring for the PC aspects. For instance, thalamic involvement, 1-1. One, one. Cerebellar involvement, 1-1. One, one. And you have cerebellum on, on the occipital, 1-1. One, one. That is six points. Then midbrain, two points, two. So we have a 10-point system for the aspects on MRA, not on the CT. On the MRA, we have posterior circulation aspects also. This calculation came to only seven. That means the two cerebellum, one plus one, and the one the occipital, the two occipital, one plus one, and one cerebellum, one. So we had an aspect score of seven on this patient. That's why PC aspects very good. The prognosis also becomes good. And we can also do what is called as posterior circulation collateral score. You can actually go and look at the angio. You can see the angio where you can see the exit of the ICA exit of the scar and then look at the caliber of the posterior communicating artery and you can compare it with the PCA. With this, you can do a scoring system again. That's called as a posterior circulation collateral score. I am sure the collateral score would be quite high in this patient, which should be the reason why this patient responded very well. Obviously, during the IV thrombolytic window, we will not have enough time to go and see all these things. But now we can sit and just look at those things and we can come to a conclusion, in my opinion, that a good posterior circulation collateral score and the good PC aspects in this patient were the two reasons why this patient dramatically improved. Great case for learning, I think, sir. Yeah. Uh, did this patient have any history which would make him prone to dissection, like uh, any trauma or any barber, going to a barber's shop or any neck manipulation? Did he have? No, retrospectively, we have asked about the same, actually, but there was no such history suggestive of any trauma or neck manipulation or something like that. Did we have a CT angio on him, sir? No, sir. No, sir. Just after this, uh, we have done this MR angio next. Uh, after 24 hours, we have done this MR angio. And uh, what, cardiac what cardiac investigations you have done so far? Cardiac 2D echo was done and uh, this uh, ECG monitoring during this, uh, whatever the, uh, in ICU he was there for four, four, four or five days. But during that monitoring there was, as per the staff and all these things, there was no, this any arrhythmias noted on the ECG monitoring. And uh, this echo was absolutely no, but TE was not done in this case. But you will have to find the Yes sir, yes. What was the age of the patient? 
around 45 is 45 you know uh, he is very important at 45 at 45 elr is not that important elr is basically done for detecting paroxysmal atrial fibrillation that is the main aim and paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is very uncommon before the age of 60 so after the age of 60 that is very important elr but before the age of 60 55 50 45 uh, t is very important because you want to rule out patent for a menovel yes uh, so i think you should do his t to rule out yes, patent yes. for it yes in the follow up we will try to do so yes. and aortic arch and all that uh, on this uh, on this uh, discharge uh, during the discharge point of time is there any means in such a mm-hmm. setting, setting case we have seen uh as is there any role of pica grelor on uh, starting after during this uh, after discharge along with eco sprain you see i'll tell you one thing mm-hmm. double anti platelets are not to be given in thrombolysis right sir most important thing mm-hmm. the double anti platelets ha- are to be given only in two situations mm-hmm. one is those who are minor strokes right mm-hmm. and minor strokes are three or less than three previously it was five now we say three or less than three. number 1 mm-hmm. number 2 uh if the patient is having a if the patient is not thrombolyzed that mm-hmm. is the first criteria thrombolyzed patient is not to be given so patient should not be thrombolyzed and then they should have a minor stroke or they should have a uh, intracranial arterial stenosis then you can give double antiplatelet uh mm-hmm. other than that uh, we have to give only single antiplatelet now your question is that suppose if we have to give double antiplatelet suppose for instance, can we give tegalor straight away yeah. yeah you can give up to one month it's a choice to you now you can give a combination of uh, i mean the first proviso is that double antiplatelet has not to be given to all stroke patients it has to be given only to those uh, who are as i told you who are having either intracranial atherosclerosis or who are having uh, very minor strokes and those who are not thrombolytic Now the question is which two antiplatelets you will choose? Well, you can choose either clopidogrelor aspirin, or you can choose uh, dipyridamol or aspirin, or now you can choose also ticagrelor plus aspirin. So this is one more option to you. So in the practical world, we give ticag. Oh, uh, and, and there is one more indication. If you have if you have uh, stented, yes. the patient, if the patient has been stented in intracranial stent, if it has been put, there is a small percentage of patients, you know, with TIAs and all. where patients may have been stented then again you have to give double antiplatelet now uh, as far as the dipyridamol and aspirin that has fallen into disrepute now although it is still in guideline but people hardly use it because it causes headache and other uh, side effects do clopidogrel and aspirin has been a favorite combination then usually that is the first first combination which people use but if a patient fails that then he is given a combination of ticagrelor and aspirin now more and more there is a trend to start it in the beginning only rather than giving it later on uh, because we know that about 30% of the asians have got a resistance to clopidogrel so therefore rather than giving clopidogrel and aspirin it is it's a good idea to give ticagrelor and aspirin uh, in the first one month but it's only up to one month and then you have to stop it and in fact if you go to the if you read between the lines in the guidelines uh, they are saying ticagrelor should be given to those patients who are having at least 30% of the intracranial arterial disease 30% stenosis but you know in actual practice we don't go to those details and not check for that but uh, uh, bid dosing are they recommending that also if it is not possible to give ticagrelor no but clopidogrel bid dosing is not recommended but loading is recommended and loading how much 300 or 600 so you can give 600 on the first day i don't give 600 i'm afraid of bleeding but it has been recommended because there were two trials one was chance trial and was point trial in one they used 600 in one they used 300 so they have, they have, on the day one only on the day one and after that from second day you can give 75 ml but not bd dose dose is dose is one only after loading it on the one so i give 300 mg on the first day 325 aspirin on the first day and from second day 75 So, uh, so, so we have got no more choice of antiplatelet. That is a good. Uh, many of our patients are on ticagrelor. Binakshi, what is your your, your experience with ticagrelor? Sir, so one bad experience, and after that, I have not used since. Oh, and what was that? Bleed. Hemorrhage only. Hemorrhage only. 
So afraid to use that sort of thing. But uh, but uh, no no don't be don't be afraid don't be afraid. Uh, the, probably now any see now you, your patients will not bleed. If you go by <laughs> statistics, my tenth patient may bleed, your first patient may bleed, but average will be the same. It can't be different in Madurai. So it is a good fear. Yes. Yeah. Fear. Entire yeah. cardiology, entire cardiology is these days based on tachycardia. Our interventionists have stopped using uh, clopidogrel. They have given tachycardia and aspirin only because this resistance issue is a real issue with the clopidogrel. Many of them say so. So, so this does not depend on all those, uh, uh, you know, gene polymorphisms and slow metabolizer and all that. It's not a pro drug. It's a direct drug. So therefore, you can uh, use it. That's why it's number one in cardiology. You know, cardiology has totally replaced clopidogrel. With it. So, any other our panelists and our chairpersons, moderators, any comments? Be welcome. We still have two, three minutes left. Subsequently, what was the treatment given in this patient, sir? After, but, uh, because you are saying embolism, what would you, what did you follow him up with? Actually, uh, on uh, day two, we have started Ecospin 150 along with Atostatin. Given low, low molecular weight repairing for seven days in this patient. Because we thought that uh, the deterioration happened so rapidly, we didn't want to I mean, recurrence or something. We, we are just afraid of that. So we have given low molecular weight OD dosing, but for seven days we are giving in this case. And then subsequently, on, only aspirin? On, on discharge, ecosprin, and that was statin high dose, 80 mg. One thing that I would suggest is that when you get an MRNGO, I think. Uh, Adding a time of flight sequence for the neck vessels would actually give much more information than just doing an intracranial thing. Because in that case, probably you would have, if it was a dissection, you would have seen the dissection on the neck sequences. And it hardly takes two, three minutes extra yes. time of flight. So, and doesn't require contrast. It's quite easy to, you know, and as a protocol, probably if you keep uh, uh, doing both uh, intracranial yeah, and neck. We have this yeah. 1.5 TMR and their neck angios are not that good, sir. They are okay. not very really excellent. So these intracranial angios are good, but the quality of these extracranial, uh, this, uh, this neck angios is very bad here. So we are not very sure what, what is showing into them. And again, it leads to some confusion. Sir, even, even I work on a 1.5 Tesla machine. It's quite okay, yeah. I believe. So at least you can make out some of these major things. Some of the smaller webs and all you'll probably not see. But the major things like if it's dissection, occlusion, you will definitely make out. Next time we'll try to do include in that uh, protocol yeah. next any any second follow-up imaging we'll try to do this neck angel also. Yes. yes, sir. So thank you very much. I think sir, your voice is not audible. No, I'm saying we had great cases today and good presentations, good discussion, and we are finishing in time. So, can we hand over to MQR? Yeah. So, I, I would like to thank our speakers for today, Dr. Mutunga and Dr. Chaudhary for their good pres presentation, and our faculty members, Dr. Minashi Sukhum, Dr. Randu Kukhani, and of course, our post-ed Dr. Sudash Kosar for giving us valuable insights for, uh, for the two cases presented today. So thank you so much and uh, have a uh, good day, uh, rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, sir.